Good afternoon, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Today should be a somewhat shorter lecture than they have been, thankfully. Um, and it's the last lecture before our you know, major exam. So just keep that in mind. Um, with that being said, even though you do have an exam this week, you also have quiz seven that will be available from now until uh, Sunday. I actually really recommend that you take this before the exam because a lot of the questions that you're going to see on this are very similar to what is going to be on the test. So make sure you're taking advantage of these. And while this only pulls from about five lecture or five questions from today's lecture, I did put like 10 review-ish questions, particularly ones that people have missed in previous lectures and previous quizzes to kind of remind you to make sure you're paying attention to some of these things. So do kind of take advantage of that, use it to help you study. Additionally, um, like I just mentioned, exam two is Friday of this week. You have two options to take it. You can either take it online, and that'll be from, uh, I believe, 8 a.m. until 3 p.m. is the window that I've, I've been allowed to give. Um, it is through Respondus, so that means you do have to have one your ID with you at some point during the test. It'll ask you to prompt you to like, show it to. And two, you need a webcam. I'm not going to go back and look at those webcam videos unless they flag it, but keep in mind that whole system is designed to see if you're like looking away for more than a couple seconds, it'll flag it. So I'm not looking there and staring at what's in your bedroom or anything like that. I just purely want to make sure that you're not cheating or not. Because honestly, there's 450 of y'all. It's too damn hard to like go through and watch everybody's video. That's stupid. Um, but anyways, uh, like I mentioned previously, there'll be a review this Wednesday during our normal scheduled lecture time. Bring in questions if you have them. If you don't, we'll finish a little early and we'll head on out. And that way y'all have more time to study. Uh, not that y'all use it for that, but you know, it is what it is. Um, again, like always, I'm gonna record it just so that way if people want to you know, keep on top of things, even if they can't be here personally or physically, then that's fine too. Along those lines, I do wanna mention that it's great to see a lot of y'all back because I know that a lot of y'all have been missing the last couple of lectures. It does matter and it will help you if you come to lecture in person. I understand that it's a pain sometimes and there's days you just don't want to be here. But even then, make sure you're keeping up with the videos. If you aren't able to be here for whatever reason, make sure you're watching them as they come out and not letting them all build up until the last couple of days. As y'all have noticed, this material is a little bit more difficult than our previous exam. And this is historically the test that everybody does the worst on. So take advantage of the extra credit and make sure you're paying attention and studying. I'll say that again and again and again and again until I'm blue in the face, but some people still won't listen to me, but I'm trying to be very clear. Take advantage of these opportunities now and you won't have to worry about this later. All right. And along those lines, don't forget about the extra credit. It's really straightforward to do. Go find five plants, five animals. Just make sure they're not a pet or something that's growing up in a flower bed and you're good. All right. Before that, uh, we get too far into the weeds here. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. All right, so when you turn it in to web courses, and keep in mind for those of y'all that have submitted it already, I've kind of grandfathered y'all in because I wasn't super clear. In the assignment description, there's a rubric and example submission. What I'm looking for is a screenshot of like those, all those like on your homepage of iNaturalist, it'll have like all of them with like a short, quick description and that's it with a small picture. That's all I need to see. But on that, I want you to put that into a Word document because sometimes those images just don't come well through that system and put your name on it, what you observed and what's a plant, what, and like kind of mark what's a plant versus what's an animal. Just so that way if Katie's grading it or I'm grading it, we can get through it pretty quickly. And that way we know for certain, like you actually know the difference between a plant or an animal. I feel like that's kind of important, right? Yes. There has to be at least five plants. But you know, if you catch if, or catch, if you find more things than that, that's also awesome too. Um, I'm trying to figure out a way that I can reward those of you that like find either the most species or the most uh, individuals, that kind of thing. So keep that in mind too. I'm not 100% how I'm going to do that yet, but bear with me. Keep in mind for the next exam, there's going to be a very similar kind of iNaturalist extra credit assignment. And then for the fourth exam, there will be an extra credit, but it'll be different. So keep that in mind. There's a lot of opportunities, and this will be kind of the thing that you're going to use a lot. 
Any other questions? Cool. So today we're going to be talking about animal reproduction and development. It's our last part of this kind of system biology talking about how different organisms have to, or what they have to do in order for their bodies to work so that they can produce or continue to thrive and then can ultimately produce offspring and move on to that generation over and over and over again. Uh, one thing before we get too far is I will reference male and female. This is strictly from a biological perspective. There's a lot of gradient in this, especially if you look across the animal kingdom. So while we do use humans as an example, this is a generalized example, there are differences but there's also a lot of gray areas too. So just keep in mind, like I'm not referring to gender in any way. I'm specifically talking about biological sex in the majority of, you know, organisms. And this does change pretty rapidly. I just, I have to have like a model so that way I can talk about the differences, if that makes sense. Now, animal development is gonna have to begin with reproduction, right? You can't grow and be a bigger organism until you are created in the first place, right? Where you have to just magically show up out of dust, however you want to put it. Um, so together, reproduction and development are the shared features of all multicellular life, right? Because as we've talked about, in order for you to exist as a, and truly be life, you have to be able, not necessarily, or at least you as an organism, you as a species have to be able to, you know, pass your genes on to the next generation over and over and over again. And primarily the way this is done is through reproduction, right? Now, some animals and a lot of plants and stuff can do this asexually, which simply means uh, they're basically taking a very, very similar version of the genome that they have. It's not exactly 100% clonal, just kind of depends on the situation. And it just kind of like puts that into the next generation and just kind of replicates over and over and over again. Things like bacterial cells, a lot of plants will do this. Jellyfish, coral reefs, a lot of that stuff are based off of these asexually reproducing critters where they're going to just kind of do a lot more cell division and replicate that way. Great example of this includes sponges, nigerians, which is jellyfish and hydras, a few others, unfertilized eggs of some bees are, are done this way. So for instance, um, a lot of male drones when it comes to like honeybees will often be a haploid asexually reproduced critter. Like they're not actually coming from the same genes that the rest of them are used. Um, aphids, lizards are a really cool example. Basically, they just, if they can't find mates, they just say, screw it, we're just going to become a clone and kind of keep passing our generations on without having to find another partner. Um, asexual reproduction requires a minimal amount of energy and is advantageous in environments that do not change much over time. But I'm sure, as y'all have noticed, even in the context of like 10 to 20 years, environments change drastically. So this may not always be the best answer. And so that leads us to sexual reproduction, which is extremely common in animals. You see it a lot in plants as well, but outside of animals and plants, it's not as common as you see asexual in the rest of like the kingdom of life. So this requires two parents, each contributing half of their DNA to an offspring. It's not always male, female. It can be some interesting combinations there including having multiple paternity in some situations, which is kind of cool. Um, and in many species, sexual reproduction entails high energy costs. Because not only do you have to you know, find a mate, make sure that mate's you know, perfect for you as an animal or whatever, um, ensure that their fitness is good thing to pass on to the next generation, right? You gotta be a little choosy. Um, all of that stuff takes energy and time. And if you don't have access to that, this may not be the best option for you. Now, although sexually reproducing individuals use energy finding and courting mates, that variation in the offspring is incredibly adaptive and in what gives them the ability to kind of morph to whatever environment they need to be, right? Because you're taking half from mom and half from dad or however you want to put it. And when you do that, you're able to kind of mix and max the genes in a particular way. And so that way, if something is, for instance, a really beneficial gene for a particular environment, it'll move through a lot faster than if it was something that was just asexually reproducing. Because just the rate at which that gene shows up in the population will be a lot slower. Let's get into a little bit more of the specifics of this. So in mammals in particular, you have what we call haploid gametes, which are the sex cells. So that's things like sperm or egg cells, right? And this means that when we say haploid, means they have half of the number of 
uh, chromosomes in their body or in their cell, cellular, cellular membrane, whatever you want to put it. So for instance, if you have 46 chromosomes as an adult human, right? Your haploid gametic cells are going to have 23. And what that is, is it's just a reduction of like each one, say for instance, each one of those 46 chromosomes has a, it's in a matching set, right? So when you go down to being a gametic cell, you go from having two copies of each of these chromosomes to just having that one copy from that point on. Now, ultimately, by doing that, by having those, creating these haploid cells, it allows you to then recombine them when you do have some sort of sexual or reproductive encounter. And what that does is it keeps you from having too many genetic uh, abnormalities and things. In other words, if you only have, you know, one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad, when they come together, it'll be back up to that normal number instead of taking chances of, well, now you have four. And that can be problematic for a variety of different reasons, but it can also be beneficial in a variety of different reasons too. It's kind of complicated. Now, fertilization can take place both internally and externally. So for instance, uh, for a lot of fish or things like the sea urchin, uh, they're going to use external fertilization, which is where you're going to just kind of release things out into a cloud of water and hope that they find things. Especially, and this is more notable in times like the springtime here in Florida. If you've been ever just coughing up a lung because of allergies, that's usually pollen, which is plant sperm, right? But then you can also have internal fertilization, which is kind of usually what you see in a lot of organisms, um, particularly in mammals and a lot of the like upper level vertebrates, more derived vertebrates, I guess that's they put it. Um, so birds, mammals, um, pretty much all reptiles and like half of amphibians do this. But the other half of amphibians are completely external and fish are, are just totally external for the most part, except for a couple of like random ones like sharks. Now development is also ultimately gonna be given with that side. So after you fertilize, you know, an egg and a sperm into an egg, right? You have these two haploid cells that are coming together. That first cell that the true diploid cell is going to be called the zygote. And that's going to be what begins to divide and after fertilization is complete and soon those cells are going to differentiate and become different and require different functions so for instance like this is like the most basal cell right ultimately what will happen is as it continues to divide and divide and divide some of these are going to take on different uh properties and we're going to specialize so some might become muscle cells some might become epithelial tissue all that kind of stuff that's where this whole process happens now, genes are going to determine what cells become what, how they form, how they fit together, all that kind of fun stuff. Ultimately, determining the overall shape and the structure of an animal's body in a process called pattern formation. Now, going from that zygote to ultimately an adult critter, right? Development is very different. You can be something like a, cat or a caterpillar and a butterfly where what you start out as is going to look completely different than what you look like as an adult, or you're going to have kind of that similar look to throughout your entire life. Things like humans, even though we change pretty drastically, we're still direct developers. We still ultimately have, you know, in theory, four hands, or sorry, two hands, two feet, five feet, or, you know, y'all know what I mean. It's not a long thing, bear with me. But, and that's why we kind of generally categorize these things as either indirect or direct development. So in this case, indirect development it means that you're going to look completely different than the adult form. Uh, a lot of fish do this pretty early on, where they look just bizarre for their first couple of stages. Obviously, a lot of insects will do this. A, a classic example is the caterpillar into the butterfly, where it has that cocooning metamorphosis thing. Um, this is kind of like. One of my biggest frustrations with the game Pokemon is it screwed up the definition of metamorphosis and evolution for like an entire generation of people. Because keep in mind, what's happening here is metamorphosis. So to Pokemon, this would be evolution, right? That's so just keep that straight. Um, another great example of this is tadpoles and the frogs, right? Tadpoles have entirely different life histories. They have gills instead of lungs, right? They have tails instead of no tails at all when they become adults. They have no legs and then you know magically grow them out of nowhere when they become adults. And all that stuff is really important to understand because 
If you're going through that process, you have to have specialized adaptations that can handle that process. Things like being able to shut off your immune system so you don't accidentally attack all this brand new tissue that's beneath your body and it might think it's some sort of board invader. And that can also have a lot of consequences as well. But then you have the classic direct development, pretty much anything that's going to have a roughly the same general shape as the adult. So for instance, the tortoise, humans, dogs, cats, anything that's going to have like, there's, there's not some magical point during its development where it goes from peak to B, it just kind of has a slow gradual change from a slightly adult to a slightly, or from a slight, you know, baby form to an adult. So quick review question here. What is this role of the zygote in sexual uh, life cycle? Should be pretty straightforward, right? So what's the definition of a zygote? There's somebody raise a hand. I think I heard somebody say it. But it's simply just that first cell of that new offspring, of that new creation that's come out of nowhere. That's all it is. So in this case, the answer is clearly C. It's not re, it's not making male gametes, it's not making female gametes, any of that kind of stuff. Now, ultimately, in mammals, we have the reproductive system that's going to be responsible for producing and transporting gametes, as well as being able to harbor them and allow them to grow up at least until they're ready to go into the outside world. So in the traditional male and female system. Both include pair sets of gonads, which are ultimately derived from the same set of tissue um, initially as they're, as they're developing. So you have testes and biological males versus ovaries and biological females, which are both just kind of generally referred to as gonads and referring to them together. And these are the reproductive organs that contain those germ cells for which are going to ultimately give rise to the gametes. Now, those germ cells are typically going to have to go through a maturation process where you're taking them from a very basic cell to a hyper-specialized cell from something like, for instance, uh, sperm, they lose a ton of the characteristics that make up a traditional cell. And they're pretty much just mitochondria and a, a DNA packet, because all it's designed to do is get through the uh, reproductive tract of a, a, a biological female and fertilize that egg. That's all it needs to do, right? So why not keep, or why get rid of, not get rid of all the other stuff it doesn't need? Now these gametes are the sex cells that are meet at fertilization. So you have the haploid nucleus of a sperm cell that's going to enter into an egg cell. It's going to fuse with the haploid cell and that's ultimately going to become that initial zygote, right? And that fertilization is the result of the formation of a diploid gamete. You're going from 23 and 23, they're going to come together, you're going to end up with 46 top or 46 chromosomes. As we mentioned, those male gonads are called the testes. Males have two testes and a set called the scrotum. Males should know what the stuff is by now. Um, and it's located on the abdominal cap outside of the abdominal cavity, which allows for temperature regulation. And that's very, very critical because sperm in particular is highly vulnerable. And so if it gets too warm, it kills off the sperm and it's not going to be able to perform how it needs to. So this is in particular one of the reasons why they kind of warn you if you're sitting here with the laptop on your lap, particularly men. They don't want you to do that because the high heat from the laptop will actually fry everything. So don't do that. So if you would like to have kids at some point, maybe don't do that. Um, inside of these testes, you have long folded stimuli tubules, which are there, which is specifically where you're going to create these sperm cells. Those sperm are secreted in something called semen, uh, which is basically just a biological cocktail of a bunch of different things that are going to be advantageous getting the sperm into the reproductive tract and allowing it to, one, remain mobile, and two, be able to kind of persist. Because there are a lot of things that are both in humans and outside of humans that are designed to kill sperm on contact, right? Because you only want the best sperm, which means the best genetics, right? So mature sperm is going to be stored in the coil tubules of the epididymis. That sperm is going to travel from the epididymis to the vas deferens. A duct that is there just above the urinary bladder is going to convert into the ejaculatory duct, which is why if you've ever heard that there's like two reproductive openings, or sorry, there's two primary openings in the end on males versus three in females, is because the reproductive tract and the urinary tract are combined in males, which can lead to a lot of issues. Um, another one of those weird evolutionary like 
kind of screw ups if you think about it, because it doesn't make sense that they're in two separate categories, two separate tubes. But for whatever reason, those tubes merge together and it can cause major diseases, issues, or just a lot of other problems. And ultimately, it's the seminal vesicles that are going to then secrete most of the fluid that forms that semen, all of the things that are going to help semen survive through that trip. The sperm are then going to become activated before they leave the body, which basically means that they're just basically going to be triggered to tell all of those like highly powered flagella that are at the back of them, that are powered by all those different mitochondrial uh, parts of the cell to start actually firing and getting that tail moving as quickly as possible. This is done through the prostate gland, which is in the surrounding parts of the urethra and secretes an alkaline fluid that activates that sperm to sweat. And that sperm is then going to travel out the ejaculatory duct to the urethra, and during the ejaculation, that penis is going to discharge semen from the body into wherever it's going, right? Now, it's important to kind of keep an eye on the prostate gland because especially as you get older, this won't work as well and can lead to either uh, reproductive issues or it's probably one of the most targeted things for cancer screenings in men because they're biological men because in particular, this is an area that just isn't very well designed for lack of a better word. And it often will have cancer cells because it undergoes so much um, cellular division normally that when you have slight misformations that during that cellular division, that's when you get cancer cells, right? Now that actual sperm development is gonna begin in, uh, during puberty where you're gonna have these germ cells which are fairly basic cells, right? They're just kind of classic. Uh, diploid cell, then you're going to have to go through meiosis one and meiosis two to actually get them into these little spermatids and then further development of the mature uh, sperm cells where you're going to have that elongated flagella that actually allows the function that you need to. We'll talk more about mitosis and meiosis a lot in this next coming unit where we're going to go into evolution as well as genetics and all that kind of fun stuff, but just know that that's the general process for it. These uh, germ cells are going to be formed inside the developing fetus and stay active inside the testes until puberty. So very similar to how you would associate with biological fe uh, females and kind of the development of egg cells. It's very similar, except for you have a much higher amount of mitosis once they start being developed. Now at puberty, the sper uh, spermatogenesis is going to begin and ultimately continues to constantly throughout adulthood. And again, it's going to start with those germ cells which is at the periphery of each seminiferous tubule and undergo mitosis ultimately into the primary spermatocytes, which are just kind of seen here growing and developing and then kind of spreading off into other primary spermatocytes. Those are going to then undergo meiosis one, which is going to allow it to form into haploid cells. Basically that's that first step that you're going to take it from 46 chromosomes and like two different with each being in a pair and taking it down to 23, which is a single pair or a single individual for each pair. And from there, you're then going to break apart those uh, pairs and keep it still as 23, but it's going to kind of, so for context, this is something that we could probably talk about more later, but don't worry about it too much for this. Each chromosome is a set of two. Uh, so not only are your chromosomes paired, but each chromosome is kind of like duplicated over, over itself. So that X that you see, if you were to pull them apart, it's like half and half, it's like the exact same stuff coded over and over. And so during that second step of meiosis, you're actually breaking apart those exact same ones. That makes a little bit of sense. Don't worry about it too much for this example, we'll go into a lot more detail when we talk about mitosis and meiosis, but just know that that's a thing. Ultimately, those little spermatids are gonna then go through a complete maturation process where those sperm cells are gonna be then released into the lumen of the synaphorous tubules. Or again, you can see like the development of the little flagella here, this little packet right here where you've got all those mitochondria that are created and it basically just went purely there to power that flagella as quickly as possible. And ultimately remember that sperm are adapted for swimming and fertilizing eggs. And that's why you see this kind of shape in a lot of other organisms outside of just sex cells, right? Tadpoles look like this. A lot of fish can look like this. It's because they're perfectly designed through swimming through thick liquids. Now, each mature sperm cell is going to be a haploid nucleus with a long flagellum, a shit ton of mitochondria, and a capsule like uh, astrosome that's going to help it penetrate into the egg cell. Now, ultimately, like everything else in the body, all of this is controlled by hormones. So you have DNA and RH, 
which is going to regulate the production of the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone via the anterior pituitary. And that LH and FSH are then going to stimulate the testes to release testosterone into those vestibules and ultimately trigger uh, spermatogenesis. And again, just like everything else, it's a negative feedback loop. So if you need to produce more, you increase the output of those things. Or if you need to increase less, you increase the output of a different hormone to turn it off. Another quick question here. So as the sperm cell passes through multiple tubes along with its uh, journey in the male reproductive system, which of the following comes last in the sequence? Should be pretty straightforward. B, right? The urethra, that last connection between kind of like how your digestive tract and your uh, respiratory tract share very similar tubes at the top. It's kind of the exact same here at the bottom. The urethra is shared between that urinary system and the reproductive system in biological males. Now, in, the fe in biological females, you have the uh, gonads, which are known as the ovaries. Uh, these are usually paired as well and are located inside of the body because they need to be a lot more protected uh, in the sense of like, they're not as heat vulnerable, but they do require a little bit more protection from just outside damage. Uh, now, each ovary is surrounded by a finger-like extinction of the uterine tube that leads ultimately to the uterus. Now, these ovaries are there to produce eggs and release them during ovulation. So in biological females, eggs production is going to begin before birth. It's going to have a brief pause where basically from ages like one till usually whenever puberty kicks in, um, it's going to stop and then resume at that point. And ultimately, every month between puberty and menopause, you'll have one oocyte typically release out of the ovary and travel through into the uterus. This isn't always perfect, and you can have times where you have way too many that are being overproduced or far too few. And that's all based off of the kinds of hormones that you're experiencing and all that kind of fun stuff. So there's a lot of issues and things that can derive from this where things can go wrong. Now, egg development is extremely similar to spermatogenesis, and it's called oogenesis. So OO is usually a reference to egg in general. So every time you see that, just keep that in mind. And although the events of meiosis mirror one another, the timing is very, very different. So you're going to go from a germ cell to the primary oocyte. With primary oocytes, you're going to undergo meiosis one, meiosis two, and then ultimately you're going to end up with a uh, egg cell as well as all these things called polar bodies, which is kind of like the cast out genes that you don't need anymore. Now, ultimately, with oogenesis is going to begin when germ cells divide via mitosis before the uh, female is even born, giving rise to primary oocytes. And those primary oocytes are arrested at meiosis prophase one. In other words, prior to your birth, they go through all of that development and it's immediately stopped right before it goes through meiosis. Now, after puberty kind of kicks off, it's then going to tell all the FSH and the LH to tell your testes or your ovaries to kind of start producing things. That's when you're going to actually get that initial meiosis that you're associated with development of eggs. Um, now, each developing primary oocyte is going to be then nestled in a fluid filled follicle, which is there to protect it. And these can be a particularly big issue, particularly for people that um, the follicles don't separate right, and it can lead to uh, cancerous issues or just a lot of pain in general. So, something to keep in mind. Uh, that secondary oocyte is going to rupture the follicle. And so during meiosis one, you have to produce two haploid cells, right? The large secondary oocyte and a polar body. The polar body is just kind of the junk left over. It's usually just genes and a little bit of cell membrane. It's not actually a full uh, developed cell per se. And ultimately, uh, the polar body is going to decompose, although it may divide into a few other polar bodies first. Now, the secondary oocyte is then going to be releasing over into the uterus tube, and they've been called an ovulation. Now, during that process, uh, the ruptured follicle is going to transform into a gland called the corpus luteum. Meanwhile, that meiosis is going to halt at metaphase two and does not resume unless that sperm con unless some sort of sperm contacts that secondary oocyte. Now, if sperm does fertilize that secondary oocyte, it's going to complete meiosis two. 
And the result is going to be a fertilized egg and an additional polar body that's going to continue on to the uterus. And if an egg cell is not fertilized, it's just going to travel to the uterus without completing meiosis, and ultimately just kind of you know, keep going and disappear out. Now, hormones influence the female reproductive uh, uh, function as well, just like men, higher biological men. Uh, the GnRH is going to regulate the production of LH and FSH, just like in spermatogenesis, via the anterior pituitary. And that LH and FSH are going to stimulate ovaries to pre either produce progesterone or estrogen, or both, depending on what levels they need to kind of trigger particular events, and which is then going to target that uterine lining and the progesterone, and the estrogen are then going to regulate ovulation and menstruation. Now, the hormonal fluctuations are what produce the interrelated cycles. So during menstruation, like they're all controlled by how much of a particular hormone is there. And this is one of the reasons why you can do hormone-based birth control in females. Now, the ovarian uh, cycle is highly regulated by follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And that menstrual cycle is then ultimately regulated by estrogen and progesterone. In other words, FSH and LH tell the, uh, the ovaries to either produce estrogen or progesterone to then control that process in the first place. Now, the ovarian cycle is going to control the oocyte maturation with LH and FSH coordinating the ovarian cycle, which is then going to consist of that follicle maturation. And the oocyte release from the ovary. The low levels of estrogen and progesterone are then going to trigger the hypothalamus to release that GnRH, which is going to result in the release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. So basically, right at the beginning of everything, you have a fairly low level of progesterone and estrogen, and that's going to trigger your um, hypothalamus to release GnRH, which is then going to release to the release of uh, FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. So see, all that endocrine system comes back really quickly. That FSH is going to increase. You're going to see the follicles in the ovary begin to mature and release estrogen. And then ultimately, that's going to help complete that first meiosis cycle, forming that secondary oocyte. Then so that LH, which is also released from the anterior pituitary, is going to help with the actual control of ovulation. These follicle cells are going to release, increasing the levels of estrogen until a spike and during that spike, that's what's going to trigger that rapid increase in the levels of LH. And once that LH surges, that's what's going to cause the actual ovulation to occur, releasing that secondary oocyte and transforming that ruptured follicle into that corpus luteum. Now, now that you've created that corpus luteum, it's going to be there to secrete um, progesterone and estrogen, which are there to act together to promote the thickening of the endometrium, which is the lining of the uterus itself. And ultimately what happens is you kind of have two options here. So without a zygote, the cycle is just going to repeat itself. Basically, once that the lack of, or once you have that estrogen and progesterone come back down, um, it's just going to get rid of that endometrium altogether. So that's usually what's happening during a period, right? Um, so if pregnancy does not occur, that corpus luteum is going to degenerate and that's going to ultimately leave an inactive scar. And over the next several days, levels of progesterone and estrogen are going to gradually decline because it's just not being produced anymore. Those reduced levels of those hormones are now no longer going to maintain the endometrium, which is then going to exit the body through the cervix and the vagina as menstrual flow. Yes. Um, can I ask, um, what if endometriosis is not a first sex? So I'll be completely honest, I'm not entirely certain, mm -hmm. but my understanding is it is some sort of either malformation or just a lack of. Uh, basically, what happens is my understanding. So I might be entirely wrong, but. Basically, it either doesn't uh, gel right, essentially. I know that sounds weird, but it, when it's building up on the inside of the ovary right, or the uterus, it's either too thick or it's too thin. I can't remember which one it is. And as a result, um, oftentimes things just don't bind well to it. And so if you were to try to get pregnant, um, ultimately what happens is that oocyte's not going to, or that fertilized zygote now is not going to be able to bind to it. It's ultimately just going to go out. Fortunately, that's, or, but fortunately and unfortunately, that's the one I don't know about as much. Um, now, ultimately, a zygote is going to stop this whole cycle. So if pregnancy does occur, that zygote is going to divide into uterine tube and develop into a blastocyst that implants itself into that thickened endometrium. That's the whole reason it's there, right? It's to basically surround and engulf that zygote and allow it to develop properly. And ultimately, that what's going to become part of the I think it ultimately becomes part of the 
placenta and all that kind of fun stuff that's going to ultimately protect that zygote as it's going through its full uh, reproduction. The blastocyst is going to secrete human chorionic gonadotropin, which is then going to progress the regression of that corpus luteum. In other words, it's going to keep that corpus luteum there and constantly keep it producing the higher levels of estrogen and progesterone, which is going to maintain that endometrium. Ultimately, that continued progesterone production is going to keep the endometrium intact. So another quick review question here. So if the egg cell is not fertilized, the lowered progesterone and estrogen levels enable GnRH to be released from the blank, and then FSH and LH to be released from the blank. So what are these two? What's the first blank? I found it, right? Now, where are FSH and LH coming from? Anterior pituitary. Good. These kinds of questions are what I'm going to be looking to put on the, the tests and, and the quizzes as well. Where it's a very really straightforward, like this produces this. Does that make sense? So where exactly does that conception occur though? So as we kind of mentioned, like by the time it gets to the uterus, that egg cell has been fertilized and it's actually a zygote and is looking to just bind into that endometrium. So clearly conception has to start before that, right? So conception can occur as soon as it over releases an egg. So pretty much as soon as it hits that fallopian tube, that's where it can be, happen at some point. Ovaries might release multiple eggs at different times, and sperm can survive for a few days inside of the female reproductive tract. So ultimately, a fertile period can end approximately five days before ovulation, as well as last up to three to four days after ovulation. So it just kind of depends. There's a lot of different things that can make this a lot more complicated. It just kind of depends. Um, Obviously, this is pretty well tracked in humans, but in a lot of other organisms, particularly in other mammals that have very similar systems, this is very, very different in the sense of like how often this occurs and exactly how much time you have. And it can be important to know those kinds of things if, for instance, you're trying to, I don't know, make more cattle so you can have beef or things like that. So it is important to understand like generally how all these things are timed out if you want to actually have continued success of uh, breeding something or something like that. Now, there are obviously options for contraception, which can prevent reproduction. Um, technically, abstinence is the most effective, but no shit. Because um, ultimately, there's no sperm to encounter an egg, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, however, there's a bunch of different other options as well. You have tubal litigation, which is better known as having your tube side in, in biological females. You have a vasectomy in males, where it's a very similar kind of process where you're actually binding and either closing completely or uh, severing that tie completely for um, all the, like the vast deferens and all that kind of fun stuff. And those are surgical, there are surgical procedures, which ultimately prevent sperm and egg cells from ever meeting because they're not going to be able to get out of the reproductive tract intact. Yes. Yes and no. Um, vasectomies in particular, while they can be to some extent, they are always. And so it's not like a cure-all. You can't just say, well, I'm going to get a vasectomy now and then not have one or worry about it later. You have to be kind of careful with that decision. That's obviously a decision for whoever wants to make it, but you know, just keep in mind it's not always reversibles, and that's something your doctor should tell you as you're going through that process. Then obviously you have things like hormone contraception, which is there to prevent reproduction as well. This is primarily targeted at women because if you think about it from this perspective, it's a lot harder to stop one thing, or sorry, it's a lot hard, easier to stop one thing than it is to stop millions of things. So if you can block one of them from being released, it's probably why those things usually get developed. And there are some developments for male hormone stuff like this, but the efficacy is just not there yet. It's like 80%. And at that point, just wear a condom, you're more likely to sur or not, or survive not having to get a cram that way anyways. So these can come in a wide variety of different forms, uh, pills, patches, vaginal rings, injections, uh, implants that contain synthetic forms of progesterone. And ultimately what these things are doing, right, is they're mimicking that pregnancy level of hormones. They're hyping up that level of progesterone. So that way it basically think your body's being almost tricked into thinking that it's continuously pregnant. And it can actually have some really interesting results on things like um, who you perceive as attractive um, and a lot of other different things. Uh, appetite, and as a result, it can be problematic in that regard. So, you know, talk to your doctor if that's something you're interested in. Now, another thing to keep in mind too is, as with everything, diseases can be transmitted through sex. So if there's any sort of bodily fluid contact, just expect that there's some sort of way that disease can happen. Um, so, and 
especially in, I mean, y'all are adults, you kind of know this by now, just because you're thinking about like hormonal contraception or anything like that, it doesn't stop the prevention of STDs because they're a lot smaller, typically viral particles, which aren't being targeted by hormones, right? Just keep that in mind. Now, ultimately that fertilization is gonna to lead to pregnancy. So that zygote is a single cell that's going to divide multiple times and ultimately develop into a pre-embryo, an embryo, a fetus, and a newborn adult, or a newborn child. Now, in order for this to happen, a sperm cell has to swim through the follicle of that egg cell. And the outer layer of those follicle cells, are, they're going to be the kind of surround that thin jelly-like layer of the proteins and carbohydrates that are going to encase that oocyte and protect it from damage. And ultimately, once the sperm squeeze through that follicle cells, the acrosome is going to burst, spilling that enzyme that are going to digest both outer layers and then allow for the implantation of those genetics. Now, fertilization begins properly when the outer membrane of one sperm cell and the secondary oocyte touch. That sperm head is going to release its DNA as it enters into the secondary oocyte. And meanwhile, that female cell is going to complete meiosis. That sperm's DNA and egg's DNA are going to combine, completing that zygote formation. <laughs> The zygote is then going to start to divide. Um, as simple as see, as early as like 24 hours after fertilization, the zygote is going to divide for the first time in a period of rapid mitotic cell division called cleavage. So usually it's going to take that first day to like get the whole process started. By day two, you're already going to be dividing from two to four cells, and ultimately by day three, you're having hundreds of cells even potentially. That zygote is going to develop into what we call a blast site. Uh, there's a few days after fermentation, or sorry, fertilization, uh, that zygote is going to have developed into a fluid filled ball of cells called a blastocyst. That cell or cystin site, it kind of gets thrown around in both words, unfortunately. Uh, cells on the inside of the blastocyst are going to form that inner cell mass, which is going to develop into the embryo itself. Well, the inner cell mass is also going to be the source of the embryonic stem cells. In other words, that's where all those like basal cells that are going to be kind of you know, becoming part of your nervous system, becoming part of your digestive system. All those are just your basic cells before they have specific genes that are turned on to tell them what to become part of. Which is why there's a lot of research that focuses in specifically on those kinds of cells, especially for things like nerve damage, because if you can trick your body into creating nerves again, nerve cells again, you can potentially heal something like nerve damage, which is usually not recoverable. Ultimately, that blastocyst is going to implant itself in the uterus and around day seven, post-fertilization, that blastocyst called a free embryo uh, is going to be embedded in the endometrium. And during implantation, that blastocyst is going to digest and obtain nutrients from that uterine lining. Then you're going to have germ layers develop during this gastrulation. So as the free embryo continues to develop, one layer of the embryonic disc becomes the exoderm, another becomes the endoderm, and soon a middle mesoderm, you know, endo, exo, meso, um, forms from that ectoderm, completing the formula, formation of the gastrula. And during that second week of development, that's where the implantation is going to be complete. Then that's going to begin the embryonic stages of um, development, which is where starting around uh, the third week into development, that embryo is going to produce structures and supports with its development. So you have chorionic villi, which are going to project into that uterine lining and exchange nutrients with the maternal blood as well as the amniotic cavity, which is going to contain fluids that cushion the embryo and maintain constant temperature and pressure. Just like everything else, you have to maintain homeostasis or it's going to die. And ultimately, you end up with four membranes, which are there to support, protect, and nourish that embryo during its development. And you'll hear these words thrown a lot, both in humans as well as in pretty much everything that has a traditional egg. It's called the chorion, the amnion, the alcoholic, and the yolk sac. So in humans, we have specialized terms for these things a lot of times, but this is kind of the same thing that you see across a lot of vertebrates. We have very specialized parts of that placenta, which is, if you think about it, all a placenta is, is it's an egg, like a chicken egg or something like that, that's developing inside of the mother instead of externally. Then you're gonna have organ formation taking place during that embryonic stage. So usually between seven and nine weeks after fertilization is when you're actually going to start seeing some of the beginning, like true tissue that's going to ultimately become organs. 
And finally, about day nine, it starts actually looking like a, a traditional vertebrate. So, and what's really cool is if you look at a human at week 11 versus a cat versus a dolphin, they all have this very similar looking shape to them. And ultimately, all the differentiation is going to happen on later on during development. Now, birth occurs around usually 38 weeks, but with modern technologies, you can handle it upwards, I think, up to like seven months post uh, fertilization, which is pretty damn incredible if you think about it. We have two full months of development that happen outside of the womb. As a three step process, you're going to have labor, which is where the amniotic sac is going to break. Hormones are going to prompt muscle contractions in the uterus, as well as the head. The baby's head is going to press against the open cervix. You're going to have delivery, which is where the baby descends through the vagina. And ultimately, the uterus is going to expel the placenta. And childbirth is one of the few times where you have more positive feedback loop instead of a negative feedback loop, where basically as this kind of goes on, it's going to trigger more and more things to continuously build on itself and start that runaway train of hormones. So obviously humans are going to develop for about nine months before birth, where you have a fetus before week 22 is not viable, but after that time the chance of survival does increase, but it's not guaranteed. Um, and then ultimately, birth is considered premature if it occurs any time before week 35. We're running a little bit slow here. Oh, no, we have plenty of time. So where exactly does fertilization occur? Pretty straightforward. The uterine tube, right? It's not in the uterus. It's not anywhere else. It's just there. They're pretty straightforward definitions. Just make sure you understand where this stuff happens, that kind of thing. All right. So, as always, you remember with seven is due on Sunday, but I would really, really recommend you take this before the test on Friday. Review on Wednesday, and don't forget about the extra credit.